So today I'm going to be taking a look at this piece of equipment that uh, is, it's faulty, it came from work. Uh, it's according to the manufacturer, they don't repair them, they just replace them. So this is an environment control unit from a an outdoor cabinet made by a company, well, currently called Vertiv. When this thing was manufactured, I think it was called Emerson. Um, these telecom companies come and go. They, well, they don't come and go. They get bought and sold. You know, that happens. Uh, this one is 2010 vintage. And according to my coworker, uh, the, one of the, uh, temperature sensor inputs is failed and therefore it is complaining. And this is very much a no user adjustments, just plug and play. It does what it does and you can't make it do anything else. Kind of a device, not a fan quite honestly, there's not, uh, much like I said, we can't adjust the temperature on them. We can't adjust the sensors or how many sensors it's using or anything else. It just does its thing. So in use, it is installed in cabinets that look like this. That you may have seen, you know, on the side of the road or other places like that, that have telecom equipment inside them. Internally, essentially they are a 19 inch rack. Um, in the bottom here, we have some batteries to power the whole system. Um, the, this uh, control unit, this ECU is typically mounted on the door on the inside. They can't see it in this picture. And then just the other telecom equipment would be in there. In this case, since we're looking at it, um, this looks like an Emerson NetSure power system. Um, these guys here are the rectifiers, AKA DC to, or AC to DC converters. This type, if I remember correctly, is about two kilowatts, two and a half kilowatts per module. And this upper piece has the controller in it and a whole bunch of circuit breakers. And then this down here is whatever equipment that that power system is supporting. These are available in various different configurations and stuff, but this little sidecar on the side here is either an actual air conditioner or an air to air heat exchanger, like the one that this particular ECU that I've got on my workbench controlled. Here is one page from the manual. It's a fairly extensive manual, but most of it is installation stuff. There's almost nothing about this thing other than what connects where. There's no pinouts. There's no operating instructions other than um, look at the code and, uh, and deal with what it says. But it does show various different options. And in this particular one that I've got here, it was programmed like this uh, it's got two thermistors coming in here and the other thermistor inputs are not used um, the external relays out intrusion alarms and then the fans of various different uh, wattages being controlled in the bottom essentially what it does it monitors a group of thermistors uh, mounted in various places this one is factory programmed for two thermistors even though it's got five of them that it can connect to and then it controls a bunch of fans on the cabinet, some on the interior of the cabinet that just circulate air and some on the exterior of the cabinet. Um, in this case, the fans are on an, a heat exchanger, which I'm not sure. Again, it's an, it's a sealed box. Uh, there's, it's just got fans on the inside fans on the outside moving air around. Um, they are, I believe, uh, PWM fans, which this thing monitors the RPM of. And I know that because it will complain if the fans are low RPM. So there's that. Um, it also has some alarm, just dry contact closures out to other equipment so that, uh, it can tell other pieces of equipment that it's in trouble. It has some intrusion detection. So the door switches on the cabinet are connected to it. Uh, it has power coming in here. I see some mystery pins down there that I don't know what they do. And I'm pretty sure when we're using it, they're not connected. So that could be interesting. And it has a, an alarm shut off reset switch hiding there. And, um, I think four digits of seven segment display up there to show these statuses. So I think I'm just going to tear into this thing. I don't know if there's any point in powering it on. Oh, maybe there is. 
just to see how it works internally. I don't know, maybe, we'll see. Anyway, there is the cover off, stout piece of uh, steel. So we have the power coming in here. Oh, and it looks like these fan boards are actually separate modules. See that little interconnect uh, pin header there? So that's probably what this is, is just so you can keep stacking them um, or swap those boards around or whatever. And then we got 40 volts DC going into each one of those, a fairly stout connection. And then onto what appears to be the main board up top side there. So quick glance at the control board, the power coming in there, as I said. Um, you have a bridge rectifier there, which is odd because this is already DC coming in, although maybe it's just being used for, for absolute polarity protection. So that doesn't really matter if you screw up. Um, that's a buzzer there. That looks like an inductor of some kind. This guy says transformers right on it. So it's pretty obviously a transformer of some description. Big capacitor, transformer, various capacitors there. So I'm going to assume that sort of this area here is power supply. Um, that's a 20 volt capacitor, that one, and these two are 6.3 volt capacitors. So I'm guessing that among the voltages that this thing creates, if it's creating more than one, it's going to be creating a uh, five volt, probably 6.3 volt capacitors. So that would make sense. And then up here we have the thermistor inputs and that one as well. They seem to have some, what are those devices? I don't know. Let's see if we can, should we start looking at components right away? I'll, I'll look them up in a bit. So up here we have a pin header. It's not accessible from outside the cabinet, so I'm going to assume that it is for factory programming or something. And it is connected to this chip here. I'll take a look at that in a bit. We have the main chip there. This guy up here is connected to the seven segment display. Three digits, not four, like I said earlier. Uh, so I'm going to guess that that, yeah, and it's also connected to the main chip. So that's probably going to be seven segment led driver it makes a certain amount of sense i guess this is that alarm relay output and it's some of its traces go to these guys so those are four relays i'm guessing for alarm outputs just contact closure alarm outputs what is that that's the intrusion input again it's got these little devices here the buzzer okay that makes a certain amount of sense let's look a little bit closer it's actually no I think for fun, I will connect some voltage to it. Now this thing being telecom equipment runs on 48 volts and long-term viewers may remember that I did a curiosity teardown on a 48 volt telecom power supply, just a small one many years ago. I'll put a link to it up in the corner there, but that's what's on the other end of these wires. I've just got it tucked underneath my workbench just to keep it out of the way. So let's plug him in. Here we go. Let's see what happens. Okay, that little reset button mutes him. That's good, which it should because that is both the reset button and also the audible alarm cutoff. Doing what it's supposed to. So that display, I can see multiplexing flicker, which makes sense. And it's going through a whole bunch of fault codes, which are conveniently located on here. And it's likely going to tell us pretty much everything has failed. The fans are failed, doors open, the thermos, thermistors are failed, and the various fans have failed because it's not going to be getting an RPM signal back from them. And after watching it for a while, that's exactly what it's doing. It's throwing up every single fault code that it possibly can but it does show that the controller probably that guy is actually working so that's cool after a bit of poking around i have found that yeah there is a five volt power supply there and that makes sense and these little capacitors are filtering it so that's all well and good i didn't find any other voltages in here other than you know the 40 volts or 55 volts 
Okay, so people are going to uh, wonder about that. Um, telecom systems run off DC, run off batteries, and the batteries are permanently being charged by uh, a rectifying system. Uh, the float voltage, the float charging voltage of those valve regulated lead acid batteries is 2.25 volts per cell, which works out to 54 or 55 volts. So that's why what that is. Even though when the batteries are in discharge mode, they're running at 48 volts. So that's why we call it 48 volt power. Anyway, that aside, uh, everything seems to be operating normally. Down here, we have the fan outputs, and it looks like it is just driving the fans with 55 volts, basically that voltage right there, which is going to be under the control of those two devices, which are very likely to be MOSFETs, I'm guessing, uh, driving the PWM. And then the bottom two pins on this connector are going to be the tachometer coming back from the fans. So these little interconnections between the main board and the fan boards have six pins on them. One connector there, one connector there, and then one down here going out to, you know, more of those if you wanted, or you can switch them around or whatever. They're just a fairly standardized little modular board. But six pins, I'm going to assume that there's five volts and ground on there. And then there's going to be signal from the microcontroller or whatever it is up there to each of these fan outputs. So that's more pins. So there's obviously some kind of digitalness going on on there to address these boards, tell them what to do. So I'll have to figure that out. And then, of course, the tachometer coming back up again. Right? Oh, well, you don't have to figure it out, but it'd be curious to figure it out. Um, so I think I'm going to go back to the main board here and start looking a little bit closer at some of these chips and just see what kind of uh, braininess is going on in here. Let's start with the big guy. Microchip PIC33. A PIC microcontroller. Very cool. Okay. Um, what else? Let's check this next biggest guy up here. Maxim Max202 EE etc. That one I don't know. Okay. It is an RS232 transceiver. It's a serial port. Right. But it'll break out. Uh, um, the five volt logic up to the higher voltage that you need for proper ES RS-232 and also provides some, uh, protection and whatnot. Cool. Up to 250 kilobits per second. Hmm. So that means that this little header over here, judging by the traces going between there and there is a serial port for diagnostics and stuff. But again, the manual doesn't say anything about it. There's no provision for getting at it without taking the covers off. So it's probably factory proprietary. Huh. Oh, we're in the neighborhood. Let's just look at what's going on with these little thermistor inputs. They're all the same. These ones here and this one down here. I'll just look at these ones. Um, they have these two devices involved, a smattering of resistors goes to this transistor here through a couple other resistors and then disappears down through a via. All these devices surrounding it are ZP08A. Far as I can tell from my searching that 08A is basically a transient voltage suppressor. I can't find much other information other than that on it. But it seems to be able to handle 500 watts for one millisecond. Wow. The other thing that I noticed poking around these thermistor inputs is that there are these little precision resistors, 51A, and several of them in several different positions around here too. Hmm. But I guess that makes sense if you're, you're biasing the thermistors and providing a resistive divider, you want something fairly precision. And then, as I said, it bounces through these uh, assortment of little transistors here and disappears through vias. I suppose I could trace it, but I'm going to guess they're eventually going after the buffering of the transistors heading over to analog inputs of this pick over here. That would make sense. 
as I said earlier, there's some little relays there that are creating our close contact alarm outputs. This guy is pretty clearly the seven segment driver. A couple of transistors down here, switching the buzzer on and off. Sure, that makes sense. More of those transient suppressing uh, devices surrounding the intrusion alarm inputs there. Um, smattering little transistors up there, driving those relays. Sure. I mean, there's a fair bit going on on there, but it makes a certain amount of sense when you look at it, doesn't it? Um, let's look at these boards down here. And I think I'm going to get the bus bars out of the way just because there are components hiding underneath the bus bars. And, well, we'll also be able to see what's on the back then, too. So let me just yoink these out and I will... Uh, pull the boards off and get back to you in a second here. Okay, now these should just unplug. Yes, they do. Cool. Not much on the back of them except for a small smattering of resistors and capacitors. Okay, then I guess we just look at this side. Assembled in th Thailand. And I think, yeah, the other board said the same thing on it. Okay. So we have the signal coming in from this side and going out there. So it's probably just a pass through. Uh, we have one chip doing some thinking down here, probably. What are you? Oh, it's another PIC microcontroller, uh, 33F. So it's in the same family as the other one, just obviously smaller with the uh, lower pin count. Okay. So that's probably going to be talking on some kind of a communication bus on here. The other thing that stands out is these four 12 amp surface mount fuses that looks like it's taking the power to the, these transistors. Are they MOSFETs? Oral N08? Oral N08 seems to be an 80 volt MOSFET that's capable of 40 amps. Wow. 40 amps seems a lot to push a fan, and these are just typical little, they look like a computer fan, except for their, um, their 40 volt fans. They're about eight inch fans or thereabouts, if I remember correctly from the cabinet. So that's, I assume, way overkill, unless this thing can also uh, maybe control some other kinds of cooling, which is entirely possible. So that driver circuit is just replicated four times around this board. There's the fuse, those two MOSFETs, uh, diodes and capacitors and resistors, a um, little signal transistor, that transistor, and that little chip replicated all the way around. wonder what that chip is. UCC2913. Hmm. It's a power management chip. All right. So it, let's see now, where is the sense here? It's, so you can program an overcurrent limit. And I'm assuming that's just with external resistors, probably. Looks like it here, yeah. It's applications for 48 volt power systems, which is exactly what this is. Okay, well, that's cool. That is one thing about telecom equipment. It tends to have a lot of redundancy and a lot of self-protection built into it because it does tend to be operated in harsh conditions, unmanned situations. Um, you know, I mean, these cabinets you'll find on the side of the road and stuff like that. So their power coming into them could be dirty. I guess we should take a look and just see what's on the back of this guy here as well just in case there's something interesting hiding back there. Something with surface mount boards, you never know what you're going to find on the back of them. Yeah, just traces. Not a single component on the back of it at all. Oh, manufactured by Lorraine. Lorraine is another telecom power system provider whose name, again, has been bought and sold. I know that Emerson bought them, and it looks like Vertiv bought Emerson, so that's why if you're looking for this thing online to find the manual, like I did, you have to go through a few different uh, names to actually get the real thing. But it's a pretty neat board, and I kind of wish that they would allow us 
to get repairs on it, but these telecom manufacturers just seem to really not like to repair things. And once you get into their ecosystem, there's not much you can do about it other than, you know, completely change vendors, which of course, once you bought into somebody's ecosystem, you tend not to do. I'm not sure how informative taking a look at something that most of you have never even known existed is, um, but I found that interesting because this is something that I see on a fairly regular basis at work and when they're in service, we don't get to uh, dig inside them. They just work and that's how they're supposed to be, I guess. Um, but it's nice to be able to satisfy my curiosity once in a while on these things. Anyway, enough of that. Um, thanks for watching. Um, I'll put a link to that manual i guess down below in case anybody wants to look closer at it and just see how you'd install it and what 100 and was it 180 some pages of manual looks like be good to put you to sleep if you need some reading material anyway uh thanks for watching questions or comments down below as usual i will talk to you later and for those wondering the beer of the day has been torque brewing's diesel fitter stout